welcome once again to uh, All Saints Parish Church, Bakewell, where we are in conversation this morning with John Butler, who has been meditating in this uh, lovely old church um, just about as long as it's been built, I think, or certainly for 50 years of it. This morning, John, I wanted to uh, touch on something that I hope will echo with a lot of our um, viewers uh, and listeners. Um, uh, we've talked in previous conversations about a variety of uh, what, what you might call Christian topics from a Christian background. We've talked about dying to sin. We've talked about last time. We talked about the kingdom of God. Um, not all of our viewers have a um, a Christian background, a Christian context. So I thought we'd try and be um, as inclusive, as embracive uh, as possible this morning. One of the expressions that uh, I find helpful when um, diving into the mystery of the presence of God and wanting to to see through new eyes is this lo lovely expression, it's hidden in plain sight. And uh, I think there are a lot of us, and uh, a lot of the, of the folks who enjoy watching these videos, who have been uh, diligently uh, seeking uh, for, in some, some cases, I'm sure many years. And they're still uh, waiting for maybe the, the screen to go up and the technical show to begin. <laughs> um, the idea that uh, whatever it is that we are seeing in this uh, material world around us, somehow it's not it. It's not the real thing. It's a shadow of something, but we can't see uh, yet what it is um, behind this illusion. It's often referred to as an illusion, this uh, material world in which we swim. And there's this sense of searching or seeking for something other than what is before our very, very eyes, which can be frustrating. It's starting to dawn on me little by little, actually, it's not that anything will change in what is seen, it seems to me it's a change, a transformation in the seer. Um, so would you like to uh, bring some vision, some clarity <laughs> to our quest? <laughs> well, I'll try. <laughs> Yes, I like that phrase. How did you put it? Hidden in plain sight, yes. I think on more than one occasion Jesus makes the comment, we have eyes but do not see. And indeed, I think the great discovery is that it's, it's, it's no use blaming what's out there, calling the world unreal or something. It's actually all to do with these, these things here, what we call sight. It might be helpful just to consider that what we call sight dependent on these physical eyes uh, is mortal. It's going to die, isn't it? In a few eyes, my eyes will be dust. I won't see anything anymore. Um, eyes fail, as we all know. Look how many of us walk around with spectacles and <laughs> patched up in one way or another. But. Like everything in life, there are levels, levels of consciousness, levels of 
levels of sight. Um, just considering creation, think of a worm's eye view. How much does a worm see? And then go up through creation to animals of limited sight. Up, up and up through an eagle, for example, that sees very much more. I think how our own sight may become more perceptive, how often we go through the day and we hardly see anything apart from what's in our own heads, our own worries. We never really wake up, do we? And then for some reason we may wake up. Look how often we look at one another and just see dullness or often negativity in one another's eyes. And then occasionally you see someone well, good heavens, you remember it, don't you? You really meet someone. There's a sort of a, an electrifying recognition, an openness of, of understanding and instant love between people, depth of eyes. We talk of falling in love with people's eyes, don't we? Some eyes are absolutely spellbinding, aren't they? You look in someone's eyes, you don't notice anything else. You hardly notice the body. You're just tr trans transfixed by this wonderful... They say the eye is the window of the soul, don't they? You look through someone's eyes into the infinite. Yet how often do we look at people and their eyes are like this? They're downcast. They don't even look at you. Or some people talk to you and don't look away, won't they? So there are many, many aspects of sight. And, um, and then there's insight, that which sees the invisible. What is it that uh, sees beyond the outer physical form into the inner essence of things? Some people see beauty in things, other people just see, oh, that's just nothing, that's just grass, for example. Others look at it and... So, it's said that the pure in heart see God. So if we look at our hearts, what is a pure heart? We use this uh, use this word illusion very often in writings around this, and um, I think it's misleading. It can be misleading the word illusion, referring to this world as illusion, because it, it gives the impression that it's not real. For those that uh, that uh, really go into meditation. And, and many times in my own experience, uh, I can assure you that, 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 that the world disappears completely. It's just not there. It's like, it's like you wake up from a dream and it's just gone. You're in a... Well, it's really difficult to say. You can't really say where you be because it's beyond description. That's another... Yeah. That's almost another subject, isn't it? Um, so the world has literally is a, a reflection of what's in us. The world is what we make it. And as man has fallen from what's described as paradise, which is really spiritual consciousness, where there's no darkness, Imagine a world with no darkness, no shadow. There isn't. The real world is light. If you want a verification, look in the description in Revelation. There is no dark. There's no death. There's no sorrow or sighing. But again, there's the, there's the Bible, to quote from the Bible. And this world that we live in, where 
Of course it's a world of dark. The high's 50% dark, isn't it? More than 50% dark. Not only when we look out there, because everything's in shadow, or half the world's in shadow, but within ourselves it's dark. Look, stand in front of a mirror and open your mouth. What's inside? It's dark, isn't it? Yet true life is light. Well, we can't even imagine it, can we? But it's so, and in the depths of meditation, one may realize this, that it's true. So, we fall from the, the story of man's loss of paradise, paradise lost, is this fall in consciousness from, from light into darkness. And darkness is another word for ignorance, isn't it? For not knowing. And this is the human condition. We just have lost touch with reality. Therefore we, we, we try to, <laughs> one way or another, by education or reading, one thing or another, we try to find our way back. And this is this, this sort of elusive inner compass, this yearning that we all have for for love that never fails, for freedom, for that which the world cannot give. And blessed are those that pursue this path and, and pursue it long enough with perseverance and first of all get glimpses and then actually find home, which is where we come from. And then you realize what it's all been for that life is a great school of bringing us back home. It is hidden and so we are commanded, seek and ye shall find. And it is a seek and it's work. And uh, how does it start? It starts with, oh, for most people probably reading. For trying to sort out in this confusing world what what it is one really wants. So often we find ourselves in situations we don't want and often awfully hard to get out of them, but then we get glimpses of something better. And if you've got the courage, and it does take courage to break away and follow one's heart, follow what one loves, follow what one, what this inner compass is leading one to, little by little, by a process of elimination, by a process of discrimination, we, we, we find our way to something better, something better, all the time. And gradually we discover that the, and it is a gradual process because at first we always blame other people, we blame events, don't we? We blame the circumstances we find ourselves in, that we're born into this confusing age. But actually it's all within ourselves. The real limits, the blockages are within ourselves. And once we begin to discover that, then we begin the process of unraveling it all. And this again, it takes a long time, it often takes great courage, and above all, perseverance. Joy, peace, love, freedom. They're all sure indications of, of we're going in the right direction. And we go from the lesser to the greater. And true fulfillment is fulfillment of all these things and even more because it's infinite and beyond description. But we use these words because we can't do any other, really. So yes, to start with, just happiness. You know, to first, when we're young, we think we're happy getting drunk, aren't we, and breaking something. <laughs> and then we grow up a bit, <laughs> find there's more to it, or shouting our heads off at a football match or something. Which in a way is a form of meditation, because, see, we lose ourselves in something bigger. So that, in a way, is a good thing. That's, that's, that's the sort of first steps in spiritual experience. Yes. <laughs> Everything's grist to the mill. <laughs> so, so it is for millions of people, isn't it? Mm. 
But unfortunately, that only happens on Saturday afternoon, doesn't it? Or it used to happen on Saturday afternoon. <laughs> and if you're greedy like I was, you want it all the time. <laughs> you want more and more of it, ever more satisfactory. It said that nothing happens by accident. And we use this elusive phrase, God's will. And it took me years to, to figure out what's meant by that. And a lot of people think, well, the world's so awful, how can it possibly be God's will? And, and you know, some people give up the struggle at that point. But, but I always feel you only, only got to just look at the floor we're standing on and just Just see how miraculously every grain of dust, so far as you can see it, or every thread of the cloth, or the, or the cushion, is, is arranged in a wonderful order. The Bible uses the phrase, every hair of our head is counted. Well, that's a good starting point, isn't it? If, if you look at, at grass or, or just dirt, the rubbish on the blowing in the street, you see this wonderful law that actually pervades everything. Even if you watch a crowd, people, you see it's all happening under law. It's actually held by the laws of gravity, the laws of one thing or the other, the law of what's in the head just pulling people along this way and that. The, th the very thought is all, which seems so confusing, is actually all lawful. Everything is the cause and effect of something else, isn't it? the way my hands are moving. I'd, I've, I'd forgotten I was doing it. It was happening unconsciously, but yet think of the law that governs the muscles that move my hands and somehow translates what I'm trying to say into some sort of body language. It, it, there's no end to the miracle of what's actually around us once we begin to notice these little things. I can't say I always see it, <laughs> because my level of consciousness is like a yo-yo, it's always going up and down. So, um, although uh, I'm bold enough to talk with some confidence of, of these higher states of consciousness, um, don't be fooled into thinking that I live there all the time, because of course I don't. Um, What do I see in the rubbish? Well, probably something akin to this film, although I haven't seen it. But, but it, it, it is marvellous how it really all depends upon what's in one's mind. But when one's mind is just quiet and open, a quiet mind really is fundamental to this work. How those ordinary things become miraculous. Just listen to the clock striking now. When one listens to that clock chimes in the stillness of the presence here, it's something quite wonderful, isn't it? <laughs> it's normally we're unaware of it. And then one comes back to this, the quietness itself, the stillness in which we're sitting. Look, I can hear a distant car. That also is wonderful, isn't it? You hear the rise and fall of the sound of the engine. And there's this wonderful comforting presence of stillness. The everlasting arms, as it were, which is holding us in the comfort just being present. What could be more wonderful than that infinite love of these, what you can describe as the everlasting arms of God, containing not only you and me, but the whole world, and governing the way our eyes are blinking, and our hands are moving, and this, so these sounds are coming out of my mouth. It's all just wonderful. What other word can one use? <laughs> there is nothing that is not held in this perfection, really. And yet so often we, we miss this and we focus on a, a sort of 
extension of our own of our own negativity and hence see darkness and see you know suffering and death and this becomes our reality and so this is the world we live in the world we make but even the most awful situations are transfigured the cause of all the trouble is me is this this body of corruption because it is corrupt isn't it it's always getting sick and getting problems and of course it dies so it's uh, in a culture uh, which esteems the value of the body very much always worships the body um, it's rather uh, it, it, people don't like to be <laughs> referred to as the body of corruption or as, again as the, as the Bible uses the body of sin which is what, this is what sin is sin is everything that dies um, in the real world as I say there is no death so if you want to know what sin is, there's a simple formula for you. Does it die? That's sin. That's not reality. It's not the real world. This is the work, power of darkness. Power of ignorance, of not knowing the truth. The wonderful fact is, like as we did a few minutes ago, just when we fall still, stop talking and listen. And something of the wonder of creation is revealed to us, isn't it? Without us saying anything or doing anything, but rather stopping talking, stopping stopping doing things. Certainly stopping, no longer trying to change anything. There we feel the wind. wonderful thing wind is, isn't it? You can hear it. You could say the wind is hidden in plain sight. Exactly, yes. And then everything, such as the wind or the dust or whatever, or whoever is sitting opposite us is the teacher, is the angel, showing us the way. It's so simple, isn't it? I suppose it's taken me, as you see, uh, many, many years to affirm this with the confidence I can now. Because somewhere uh, through the 80 years of my life that have passed, I've been able to let go and somehow lose all that layer upon layer upon layer of Oh, personally trying to make the world a better place or be a teacher or even teach myself or <laughs> all the books I've written, all the efforts I've made, all the work I've done. I really look back on it now with, with gratitude as a great school. We learn by our mistakes. That's profoundly true. I'm still learning every day. Difficulties arise constantly. I think I'm more ready now to recognize that difficulties are really opportunities to grow. Yes, people often ask me about this question especially when we, we're young, we, we, people read about those that have a, a great awakening. Well, 
I don't know, it's never happened like that to me and I'm never really sure I've met anybody for whom it has. I, I'm a little bit sort of guarded about that. Maybe. I don't uh, want to question what other people have found, but... Perhaps being a farmer I feel more safe with a less steady, slow approach. <laughs> you know, that's another very interesting aspect. Name and form always create limits, don't they? Now, a feature of spirit, a feature of this stillness, which I keep coming back to as a way of approaching spirit, is that it is nameless and formless. Now, perhaps just resting in stillness now, you can feel how comforting it is, actually, not to have a name, not to have to fall into the whole complexity of description. Because the moment you say it's something, it isn't something else, is it? So one starts the long bumpity bump bump, fall down into duality and separation. 